Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Richard, welcome to the show. Hey, good to see you, Sam. Man, it's great. One, to have somebody on, obviously, I know very well. Uh, but it's also great to have somebody on that has such a deep bench of experience in real estate. Uh, for you, you have really kind of done the, what I'm going to call the anti-scaling of your real estate business. You have been into very large commercial assets. You've kind of done everything as it pertains to real estate, but you've really shifted your focus. So I'd love to kind of hear your journey of where you started, where you are now, and how you got there. Okay. Uh, well, um, I'm from Tullahoma, Tennessee, went to school in Knoxville and the whole plan was, you know, just kind of stick around there. And then, uh, my roommate graduated on time and, uh, moved out to California and called me up and said, man, you got to get out of here. You don't have a job yet. Like, this is the place to be. You can just find a job here. And, uh, I came on out to California. I was a guy on the couch, you know, for a while. Didn't have, uh, you know, uh, we were three people in a two bedroom place. And uh, I got out here and just, I think I watched me late night real estate commercials and I got all sucked into it. Started working at a real estate brokerage for free while I got my license uh, out here and started doing investment real estate as an agent. Uh, mostly all small multifamily, kind of like eh, two to 10 units somewhere in there. Um, and along the way, I kind of realized like I need to be on the buy side of this because A, I don't want to work because I'm lazy. And two, uh, you make more money. Right. So I learned how to syndicate deals. Uh, you know, I tied up with a little bit of money and then call everybody I knew and people I didn't even know, try to find money. And this was this was back before podcasts and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you 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 really couldn't you had to go talk to people, you know, to get money, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, I was doing direct mail marketing to uh, non-owner op, you know, uh, two to tens, um, old school non-owner op, like, uh, or direct mail. You know, I would uh, stuff my own letters and, you know, have my girlfriend at the time help put stamps on the thing and, uh, you know, mail all these things out and field the calls drive with no navigation to places in Los Angeles. I did not know where they were using the Thomas guide. I don't know if you guys have ever seen all these things like a big foldable map. Oh yeah. And so, you know, I'm driving down the freeway trying to figure out where the thing is. And, you know, you drive into the ghetto and you got no digital cameras, just have a little uh, disposable camera, take pictures. And um, so I started doing that, did pretty well with it, left the brokerage started scaling up, uh, you know, raising money and all that fun stuff and, um, started doing some bigger deals and then started doing some development deals in the form of a condominium conversion. So I would, we'd buy an apartment building, you know, tie it up with our own cash, raise all the money for the rest. And then, you know, then put, you know, for the down payment and then get a loan, entitle the thing, turn it into from apartments into condos. Uh, so it's a lot of paperwork more than anything else. I mean, there's some retrofitting that's going to go in depending on what the city does for you. Um, and, and I've done them two different ways. I've bought them with tentative track maps in place and I've put my own tentative track maps on. And if you can figure out how to entitle stuff, you can make some big bucks, but you can get hammered too. So um, like I took a loss on one that uh, I bought an apartment building, I tied it up and had an option essentially to execute on it. Went through all the entitlement process, you know, went to city hall, stood up in front of everybody, talked about, talked to the city council about why this needs to be an apartment building, had all the tenants come up behind me, tell me what a terrible person I was and I was taking their house away. You know, I had to sneak out to my car so they didn't murder me. Um, I ended up walking away from that deal. I mean, it took a year or so worth of entitlement work, legal work, blah, blah, but right about the time it was time to execute on it, you could see some cracks in the market right around mm. 2000, late 2006 ish and uh, 2007. And I was, uh, I tried to get the owner to reduce his price by hundred K and he wouldn't do it. And I'm glad he didn't because I walked away from the time and effort. I probably lost 60 grand worth of actual money plus time. Sure. But if I had bought that building and gone and gotten a construction loan and personally guaranteed it, I probably would have gone BK. Yeah. So, 
it was a, uh, it was a very, it was, it was a cheap loss. Um, and you get into some stuff like that. So, you know, I got into, I was doing the condo conversions, everything's going great, making money. Then 2008 happened. I thought I was having a stroke literally one day because everything was falling apart. You know, I had all these rentals they are in California. They don't exactly cash flow, you know, for real, especially if some people stop paying their rent and you can't evict them out here. It takes, you know, like six months and thousands of dollars. So, you know, I drove myself to Cedar sinai because I thought I was having a heart attack. I took a fistful of aspirin, put thin my blood, drove to Cedar sinai left my car running in the drive through and ran inside, told them I was dying. <laughs> and uh, they told me, no, 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 you're, you're, you know, they ran an EKG and says, you're not dying, you're just having a panic attack. And uh, I was like, okay. And um, so, long story short, kind of unwound some of those bigger deals, got everybody out at even, but it took like two years to get everybody out at even. So, I essentially worked for free for a couple right. of years. Right. Um, so, that scared me a little bit. And I was kind of mad at real estate too. I got tired of looking at spreadsheets, blah, blah, blah. I think I was watching too much Entourage too. And I went, uh, I moved up to Los Angeles and I used the same skills that I had for syndicating real estate to syndicate other deals. So I syndicated, I got a, a mortgage company up and running. I syndicated a couple of films. Uh, I thought the film thing was gonna be super fun. I got had a great time doing it, but I'm gonna let the secret out of the bag for you guys. Nobody makes any money investing in films. And once I really figured that out, I couldn't raise money for it anymore. Right. You know, like right. yeah, it, it, it's really difficult to do it. And um, so then after that, you know, I still had some uh, multifamily stuff out here and, you know, I was doing some house flipping on luxury houses down in Newport beach, uh, which was a lot of fun. And I really enjoyed it. It's I, I, if I had all the money in the world, I would flip higher end houses. It's mm -hmm. so fun. It's you get to use your creative uh, side of your brain and it's just you, you get to take something from X and turn it to Y. It's so much fun. It doesn't really make you a lot of money on a dollar per hour on what you're putting into it. That was the problem. Right. Sure. So if you want to do it to do it, then great. But don't do it thinking that's going to solve all your financial problems. Right. Um, and it's risky. You know, I mean, once you start getting in the 1.5, 1.6 million dollar range, I mean, a little blip in the stock market and then half your buyers just walk away. Um, so and it's not like you can rent that thing for sixteen thousand dollars a month either. You're going to rent it for like six, seven grand. So you're going to be in the hole, uh, especially if you got a hard money loan or construction loan or something like that. The meter's running. So, so I've done that. And then, uh, and then after I kind of wrapped that up, um, I moved some assets from California to 1031 back to Memphis, Tennessee, because I'd always wanted to diversify out of California, but I wanted to do it somewhere that I was kind of going to go anyway. And my parents, the catalyst for this, my parents finally decided that they were going to you know, retire to Memphis and be close to my brother. And I was like, jackpot. They're going to be there. I'm going to be going back there for Thanksgiving anyway. Uh, so I started buying houses. I got back into my marketing, put my single family, you know, marketing hat back on and uh, kind of like what I was doing with the multifamilies, but just tweaked a little bit. And uh, I've done everything from I've done PPC. Now I'm doing some direct mail. I've got some VAs. Uh, I got a CRM system, a lot more high tech than anything I've ever done before. It was very you know, yellow pad of paper, sticky note, and like putting stamps on letters. So uh, I'm still refining the process, but I got what, 20, 22 houses in Memphis now uh, and hoping to, you know, double that this year, maybe more and scale up that way. I'm still not opposed to doing larger multifamily deals. It's just, we want to say it depends. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. I've entered a different phase in my life now. I've got a wife and two kids. The first half of the story that I was telling you is just me and the dog, you know, nice. and yeah, you know, we could live in my Jeep if I had to. Uh, so I was levered to the hill and I, my rationale was always like, if you're going to go bankrupt, it'd be good to go early, you know, <laughs> like when you don't really have anything. <laughs> so <laughs> now you know, as my assets have increased, my level of risk has gone down commensurately, especially with the wife and kid. And um, 
I heard an old man tell me one time, he said, if you want to get rich, do commercial real estate. If you want to sleep good at night, you might want to look at single families. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Let's 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 you know run the run the tape back a little bit and talk about capital raising. So can mm-hmm. you kind of give us a picture of what that looked like? Because that's a common, you know, obviously the, the access to the money is one of the one of the biggest hurdles I think that most people trying to scale their portfolio run into. There's they run out of money somewhere. Mm-hmm. Buying, borrowing, you know, going to banks, however, however you're getting the money. To, talk to us about your process, how you approached investors, um, just kind of your mindset, how not not how you sold them on it, but really how you figured out how to get people involved in what you were doing, other than just talking about it and them saying, "Hey, man, sure, I'll give you a hundred grand. That sounds great." Yeah, and what this is two things are different now. A, I was younger and didn't know as many people and didn't have a track record in the business. And two, this, this technology wasn't here, right. uh, at least not in any like you know wide spread format. Uh, sure. So I was really having to do the old friends and family, you know, route, and then also talk to other investors that I had helped buy houses or buy apartment buildings for. And, you know, they knew me and trusted me and we got to know each other and that kind of thing. And um, yeah, it spawned partnerships with those guys. So it wasn't a big net cast as far and wide as I would probably do today if I was going to go back down that route. Um it was more relationship based okay. and uh, which I think, which fast forward to why I thought I was going to have a stroke when, uh, when uh, the condo conversion might not have worked out when 2008 happened, 2007, 2008 um, is because I, I know all these people, I care about them, right. you know, like, and even the investors that I help buy houses, like I care about these people. This isn't just, you know, uh, some anonymous uh, Wall Street bank that lent me some money and I tell them, you know, go pound sand, things didn't work out. Like, I, I, you can't do that with people that you know and right. care about. Um, you shouldn't you do know, with people you don't know, but either You way. shouldn't do it with people you don't know, but it, it carries that extra weight. You know, I think I would sleep better if I lost, you know, Jamie Dimon over at Chase a million bucks as opposed to I lost Sam Wilson a million bucks. Sure. Those are going to be two different, two different. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> so, so you went out and you just said, Hey guys, I've got these, I've got these projects. And, and you, did you structure each one differently? I mean, cause at, at that point in time, there weren't even, there wasn't even the, you know, the 506 B 506 C there weren't the, you know, the different types of syndications. I mean, how did you educate yourself? How did you come up with the models? I mean, walk us through and, that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you you could Google stuff, sort of, kind of, but you had to get books from the library and things like that. And uh, just because everything wasn't online yet, right? Uh, or it was hard to find, or weird formats, or whatever. Uh, yeah, I, we'd structure them as LLCs, make everybody a member of the LLC, and you know they'd have to be accredited or we'd have to have some sort of relationship or you know that kind of thing you know to to fit in the box right and uh just did it that way and it's slow going to do it um and you got to build but you know you got to build with anything you know you can't just come out of the box and i mean i know there's some anomalies of guys that just you know they were pushing paper one day and next day they own you know 10 million dollar apartment building but those are I, I don't know any of those guys i hear about them i don't know about them. i don't know them Right, right. Those are those are the uh, the anomaly, like you said. Okay, so fast forward, you guys unwound most of your assets. Uh, you said you got most of your investors back to even, which is you know that's awesome, especially in the uh, in the recession. So then you started buying single family. When when did you really you know turn the corner on that and start buying single family? I was wrapping up some flips from in Newport Beach on the higher end stuff, and I got a out of the blue uh unsolicited offer on a multifamily building that I had in Long Beach when and I call it a building it loosely it was termites holding hands it was just about <laughs> it was terrible it's built in 1913 it was didn't even have a foundation just had like rocks and then like the frames were built over that and then you know so you're a slumlord no it's the nice area that's the weird part so oh, wow it's just the building itself was just like the interior was really nice but the building was like man if I'm going to keep this, I'm going to have to plow so much money into it to like, just 
you know, make it last longer. Right. Um, you know, the highest and best use for that particular property probably would have been to plow that thing down and build more units, but the way the city was set up, couldn't do it. Anyway, um, I got an out of the blue offer for more than uh, I ever thought I'd get from an agent who had a 1031 client who wanted to pay all cash and was in a hurry. Oh, wow. And I said, deal. And I did a 1031, moved the money back to Memphis. Um, and you get a lot of bang for your buck when you sell stuff in California and move it to Memphis. And then I was like, hey, you know, this is uh, this is working out pretty good. You know, it was kind of an accident. I just wanted to do it to diversify. But then like in the 1031 process, I was like, hey, I'm making some money here. Like this is uh, like I'm already buying under market and making some dollars on the buy where it was just still really hard to do that in California, unless you're going to add square footage or do something that was a real value add. Right. Um, and not that where I invest is uh, not competitive. It's very competitive, but it's, it's a different kind of competition than there is out here in California. So right. that makes sense. Oh yeah, absolutely. So tell us about your process, kind of how, obviously we understand why you picked Memphis. Mem- Memphis is one, you've got family here. And secondly, it's a, it's a phenomenal uh, mm-hmm. rental market. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that come to Memphis for rental property. So why you picked it isn't maybe necessarily as important as how you developed your team, how you own, how you manage them, how you are not on the phone all the time. Walk us through kind of your, your process there. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I cheated a little bit on the team because my old business partner that I used to flip condos or do the, uh, you know, multifamily and condo conversions, well, he moved back to Memphis. So I was, I just called him up and said, Hey man, you know, want to make a little extra money and help me do all this? And he said, yeah, sure. So, uh, and he's, re- he's really doing it to, for me as a favor. I mean, he owns 200 something houses out there and a few commercial buildings. Uh, you know, he's, he's kind of helping out old college buddy at this point. Um, but yeah, I got that going, but then I built off of him. So, you know, he already knew, owned some things and he's kind of gave me some introductions around town to, title companies and uh, I guess they're not called title companies, they're closing companies in California or in Tennessee and banking relationships, uh, insurance I found on my own, uh, property manager that he had been using that I really liked. And obviously I went and interviewed all these people as well and did my own due diligence, but you know, it all, it's short, it gave me a big shortcut. Right. Um, And, you know, having family there is just another added bonus because you've got somebody, if you need to like, Hey man, can you guys run by and take a look at this for me or whatever? Um, yeah, and that's kind of how I got the team set up and I flew back there for all this, you know, I physically went back there and spent some time, um, you know, Tennessee is a very relationship based place too. You know, they want to see you and do you, 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 it'll work out better for you if you go and meet these people, um, as opposed to just being an anonymous weirdo from California that probably has blue hair, you know, calling them. So, that, that's what they all think. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that, I'd say that's very true. That's uh-huh. very true. And, and it's not wrong. It's not wrong. <laughs> Definitely not wrong. You just, you, mm-hmm. you, you just, the, the, the relationship matters, I think a lot more uh, mm-hmm. here. So building that is key. What, well, also uh, just in general, like it just relationships where you, where you develop trust with somebody. Uh, I can't remember who said, I think it's Franklin Covey or something. There's like the low cost of high trust. If you mm. trust somebody, I don't have to sit and double check everything that you just told me and stuff like that. Like, you know, if Sam says, hey, man, I went and looked at your furnace. It looks like it exploded. You need to get a new one. I say, OK, let's put a new one in because I believe sure. you. Yeah. Right. No, that's absolutely true. When it comes to so, so you've got your marketing channels out there. And then how do you handle things like? you know, like you said, new furnaces, how do you handle things like repair estimates, stuff like that? How are you not involved? I mean, is your property manager seeing these properties before you buy them? How many Um, do you go ahead? Sorry. Yeah. I've got a couple of different things. Like sometimes I send uh, my main guy out to places depending on how busy he is. And I've got a few real estate agents that I work with and we've got deals worked out like, Hey, I've sourced the deal. You go check it out. If I close it, I'll pay you, you know, a fee. If I don't close it, why don't you try to set it up and get them to list on the MLS and you can give me a referral fee. I'm a licensed broker out here in California. Right. Uh, so that seems, it just it depends on the deal, you know, like, and I try not to run my guys around, you know, on goose chases either. Sure. Um, you know, like if so, you gotta be real transparent, you know, about what the likelihood of a deal working out is. Right. Um, 
And then as far as marketing goes with the PPC, I was having everything come to my email and come to my cell phone if they called from the website, which I wouldn't always answer it. You know, I was using a Google voice, it would push the Google voice and you could hear the person leave their name. And I don't know, sometimes you have to been doing this business for a long time. You can almost tell by the way somebody leaves their name if they're worth talking to or not. Right. And, um, and uh, you know, if I was had the time, I would talk to them. If I didn't, you know, I get a voicemail and then, you know, try to call them back later. I wasn't very good about calling back hangups, which now that I've gotten really into it and using VAs to call the hangups, you get deals that way. Mm. So don't be afraid to call the hangups. Like sometimes the hangup people are the ones that are most motivated because they got they're scatterbrained because they've got some event in their life, you know, it's going on They're timid, you know, or, or whatever, you know, um, and it's good to reach out to those people. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm like you, like, uh, even if we don't do a deal, you want to try and help these people. They're people going through life, same journey as you, they've hit a speed bump. Um, and you know, maybe you're not the best solution for them, but maybe you can point them in the right direction or at least give them some, some idea of what their best case scenario is of what they got. Right. Um, so yeah, I did that, you know, sorry, I've gotten off the off topic, but you know, I was answering the phone and I had a Tidio bot, still have a Tidio bot set up on there. It pushes to my phone where I could live chat with somebody if they were interested. Um, and I'd always wanted to scale up and use some VAs. I was just hesitant to do it. Cause uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a solopreneur over here and you know, you got a lot of things going on. Um, but I finally bit the bullet and cha- switched over and got some VAs to start doing things for me, especially on the direct mail. Once I started that, so, you know, you pull the list, you get your mail house to start mailing out your tranches of mail. Uh, and I hired a service to do all this stuff for me. And then I hired a service to a VA service to, to scrub all these calls because the difference between the PPC and the direct mail is the PPC people are seeking you out. And it's a different phone call. Like those people are usually pretty excited to talk to you or whatever. The direct mail, man, it's not that pleasant to answer phone calls from direct mail. Right. I mean, people get mad Real sometimes, mad. which it just makes no sense to me. Like I'm not trying to claim jump you, you know, like if you, <laughs> if you want to sell it, <laughs> yeah, fine. If not, don't worry. Throw my letter it. away. It's yeah. Just, you know, don't call use me it, about it. Yeah. Use it to line your hamster cage. I don't care. Like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the best one is, uh, I, I got, a. I used to include, and this really worked out well is in my old, old direct mail. I used to include a postcard that, uh, you know, you'd fill it out with your name, the address, your building, how many units they were, how many bedrooms, bathrooms, and how much you're getting rent, how much you wanted for the building, you know, just that stuff. Right. And, um, they would mail it back and I got really good response because sometimes people don't want to pick up and call you, but they'll fill that thing out and drop it in the mail. Uh, but one guy did not like that and that I sent it. And it was, uh, I had an account with the, the post office that would like, th- these were postage free. They didn't even have to put a stamp on there. They would just build my account. Sure. So this guy took a, one of these things and duct taped it to a brick <laughs> and dropped the brick in the mail. And I had to pay the postage for the brick. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> So forty dollars later, <laughs> forty dollars later, and like you know, you want to take that guy off your list, but he didn't write his name on there, and all the tracking numbers that I had on those postcards were just made up. They weren't real tracking numbers, you know. There, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have any kind of tracking system, you know. Oh um, gosh, yeah, that's but hysterical. I, that's pretty funny. So, um, yeah, but as far as systems and processes are going, like I really like the VA model because, like I said, it's not fun fielding those calls from the direct mail, but there are diamonds in there. There are good deals in there, but you got to get in there. And the highest and best use of your time, if you're a brain person like you and I are, and everybody's probably listening to this podcast, you need to sub that stuff out. And if you're like me, you're tight on cash, you don't want to spend money because you're like, oh, I can do that you got to break out of that. Like, yeah, you can do it, but should you do it? Right. Um, pay somebody else to do it. It's not the highest and best use of your time. Even if you're losing money at the beginning, that one deal will put you in the black. That's it's, you got to get over some of those mental, uh, those mental barriers. And I know it's tough when you first get going too, cause you have like no cash. Like I was using, when I first got started, I was using 0% credit cards for down payments on houses, you know, like, cause I don't have any money. So, um, but I knew like, well, if I could take 10 grand from this credit card and 20 from that one and put them all together, 
the down payment. And then I can just call a bunch of people for maybe to get the rest. And, you know, <laughs> that's hysterical. Richard, let's jump into the final four here. <laughs> if you were to distill everything, you know, down to one piece of advice and you're giving it to an aspiring investor, what would that one piece of advice be? Well, it kind of depends on the advice, I guess. Depends on how where the investor is, if he's got some cash or if he doesn't have cash. Uh, if you way, have cash, it's easier. Okay, yeah, let's if, have cash. All right, if you've got some money, spend some money on education. Just spend it. Spend the money on education. Be smart about it because there's a lot of shysters, you know, out in the real estate world. You know, talk to older guys who have real portfolios, portfolios right. that you know that they have, and not guys that are selling something. They're not selling a course. I'm not selling this, selling that. Find some old guys who've been doing this for a long time and talk to them about it. And, you know, because every area is going to be a little different. You're going to have some area expertise out here in California. There's a guy called Bruce Norris. He's amazing. Uh, he, he distills tons of data. If you just listen to some of these old guys, it'll save you a tremendous amount of time. Um, I'm trying to think of any other like real advice. You, you just got to educate yourself. Listen right. to the podcast. Do all those things. Uh, you're not going to do this after listening to me talk. You know, you know what I mean? Like you, you've got to drill down into this because there's so many teeny tiny little things that even the books aren't going to teach you and you won't learn them until you're doing them. Right. Um, yeah. And you, you got you got to got to do it. You know, listen to listen to the whole guys and then you got to pull the trigger sometime. Don't don't overanalyze things uh to death i mean yeah you, you can talk yourself out of deals faster than you can talk yourself into them but you sure know. sure education yeah education is definitely key when it comes to investing in yourself what's one thing you're currently doing to stay on top of your game i listen to a lot of podcasts uh and i read at least an hour a day um you know sometimes it's uh real estate based stuff sometimes it's just general business based stuff uh you know because a lot of those principles transfer back and forth uh, I read a lot of biographies and when I say read, I listen to them on audiobooks. You know, I can sure. do them while I'm working out. I can do them while I'm, you know, pushing the kids in the stroller, you know, the whole, it's, it's wonderful that right. the best $15 I spend every month is my audible account. Right. I mean, I, that will be the, if, if all of the fortune goes down the tubes, that will be the last thing that goes, <laughs> that will be the last thing that I stop spending money on. Right. Understood. When it comes to giving back, what's one way you're making the world a better place? You know, I, I was, it's interesting that you thought about that or brought that up. It's something that I'm right now with the two toddlers and I'm the only one working in the family right now. And there's not, and we're in the middle of COVID. I don't know if you guys know, but in Los Angeles, you're not supposed to like, you know, be out and about restaurants are closed, the whole thing. They did a second shutdown. Uh, but what I would like to do other than just being a good person, being a good landlord, you know, have a heart, don't throw people out if they can work, if you can work something out with them, you know, all that stuff, just, just be cool. Um, I'd really like to start doing some sort of uh, financial literacy classes at maybe the local high school or something like mm. that. Cause I don't know, it just struck me the other day, like, no, these kids know how to do any of this stuff. And I don't mean like structuring syndicated real estate investments, but just like, this is how credit cards work and right. things like that. I just think it'd be really, uh, fulfilling but as of right now man i kind of stuck you know right, donated right. a bunch of stuff to goodwill because we're bored <laughs> <laughs> and, and lockdown <laughs> right right yeah you guys are in a different situation there that's for sure if our listeners want to get in touch with you what's the best way to do that richard buys houses.com richard buys houses.com richard thanks for the time today certainly appreciate it man it was great learning more about your story and uh just seeing where you've come from and uh, where you're going you got it, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you.